thanks everyone for coming. And actually, thank me because I'm showing it for you. But anyway, um, the, thank you. <laughs> so uh, this film, I don't know if you're familiar, Serial Killers 1 was brought out a couple of years ago. Um, and I got to know Donal uh, O'Neill, or the maker of it. Uh, it was a very good film, done on a very low budget. It uh, wasn't really accepted in a lot of the major cinemas or any of that because the nature of the content goes against the orthodoxy. But they've gone on to make Serial Killers 2 with a bigger budget. Um, I think it's a really great film. It's not heavy in scientific detail. Uh, it's not too complex. Uh, it's more for a general audience, but it does bring across the uh, important message of carb moderation for health and performance. And it focuses on elite athletes, uh, not just the average person. I'll do a few slides up front because I want to do a bit of a primer. So a lot of you guys be well able for a little more technical content, just around 10 minutes around diabetes and carbohydrate. Um, and then we we'll go into the film, but don't worry, the, the film won't go into heavy technical detail. It's more for a bit of entertainment. Uh, okay, so um, that's it. Donal, by the way, his father was Kevin O'Neill, who in 1960, they won two All-Irelands with Down, and they had the biggest crowds ever in Ireland for a Gaelic event. So his pedigree. But his father, in spite of being high carbohydrate, healthy, uh, got heart disease, uh, severe, and his uncle got diabetes. Again, a sportsman, very healthy. So I'll touch on how you can still get diabetes, even if you're sporting. <laughs> Okie doke. Uh, I just came back from the OM Health Low Carb Summit in Cape Town. Uh, got to meet all these guys, talk with them, some of the best in the world, from all over the world. We have Dr. Steve Finney, who's in the movie. He proved out in experiments 35 years ago that there's an optimum nature to humans burning fat once they're adapted to it and they get off the bad stuff. Dr. Eric Westman, 30 years treating people with low-carb diets, resolving diabetes and a whole host, obesity and all other issues. Professor Tim Noakes then, who uh, actually is part of organizing the conference, he discovered uh, many, or five or six years ago, that he was diabetic in spite of having run around 30 endurance events and staying fit and healthy on an ultra-high carb diet all his life. Um, and he had, wrote, he had written the Marathon uh, Runner's Bible, so basically a famous book around marathon running. Uh, and in the first film, he tore out the section of carbohydrates because he was pushing carb loading for around 20 years. Now he realized it caused a lot of damage. So he got a lot of pressure in South Africa from all of the orthodoxy because he's a famous guy and suddenly he switched around and said, I was wrong. Uh, carb loading and high carbohydrate is highly dangerous. Um, so a lot of pushback, but he's come through now and this summit was part of that, uh, getting all these guys from around the world. I won't name the rest of them, but uh, top class people, doctors, PhDs, scientists, um, all understanding the science of human metabolism properly uh, and carbohydrate versus fat metal metabolism. You might be familiar with Asim Malhatra there. He's the UK cardiologist who headed up Action on Sugar. And he's very outspoken in The Guardian, The Mail, and on the news in the UK. So had a few nights out with him. He's a great party guy. <laughs> Okie doke. Dr. Michael Eads wrote Protein Power 30 years ago. And if you read it now, it's like stepping into a time machine. He was that accurate on insulin and carbohydrate and health 30 years ago. It's incredible to read the book now. And he's doing a new edition. And if he, with the new edition, he'll actually have to change very little. But of course, not listened to because the fat is bad paradigm was so established. Dr. Jason Fung, we'll see a little bit of his stuff. He gave me permission to use the slides. Got me out of a hole because I didn't have time to prepare my own. Uh, and here's Dr. Peter Bond. So he's Old Mutual, a large health insurance corporation. He's their chief medical officer. And they came and actually sponsored this event because they realized that the cost of premiums going through the roof. Diabetes is an absolute epidemic. Obesity has gone off, uh, off the scale. And it's literally unsustainable. And he's a good guy. He understands the science. So they sponsored the event. There's my buddy Jeff Gerber from uh, the US. Uh, thanks, Jeffrey, to say that. And Karen Thompson, who is actually the granddaughter of Christian Bernard, who did the first uh, heart transplant in South Africa back in the 60s. So great pedigree and an extraordinary job she did to pull this massive conference together. And uh, really looked after us well over there. OK, so just 10 minutes on diabetes and carbohydrate. Um, and thanks to Jason Fung, as I said. Um, and I'm going to use some of his slide content. And he has a YouTube video, The Two Big Lies of Type 2 Diabetes. It's very important viewing for everyone. 
Um, so you can Google that. And it's part of a six part uh, series on the etiology of, di or of obesity. And he goes through in six parts all of the science. <coughs> uh, compelling stuff, a lot of the stuff as well I would have given in previous seminars. So we see here diabetes basically exponentially going up. Um, back at the turn of the century, it was so rare, you only had one or two specialists. Um, we've got the high carb guidelines came in in the late 70s due to an unfortunate mistake in interpretation of biochemistry and metabolism and associational data from worldwide studies. No causation was there, but anyway, the politicos jumped on it, and after that, you couldn't stop its uh, progress. Here we have, I think, 11 or 12 percent in America now diabetics. So the exponential increase continues. Uh, diabetes in the next 15 years is going to break the world's health systems, not to mention heart disease and all the other stuff that's been driven by this profound misunderstanding of human metabolism. So we have 300 million diabetics worldwide at the moment. Project exceed 500 million uh, in the next 15 years or so. And they have to keep upping their estimates for the last 10 years or 20 years as they go, because it's getting ahead of the projections. OK, so treatment of diabetes mellitus, 1916. 100 years ago, we have Elliot P. Jolson, who was an expert, or Joslin, sorry, an expert in diabetes. And he said, temporary periods of undernutrition are helpful in the treatment of diabetes, will probably be acknowledged by all after these two years of experience with fasting. So he was realizing that diabetes was caused by dietary factors and that fasting would actually fix it. Now I'm speaking of type 2 diabetes, which is a very different disease than type 1. So in type 1, you pancreas uh, is not able to create insulin and you have a low insulin problem. Type 2 diabetes is the provoking of hyperinsulinemia, high insulin, until your body becomes insulin resistant to the action of insulin, which drives your insulin higher. And it's a cycle that basically moves on and on, like an engineering feedback loop, until it hits an E in a curve and goes out of control. So type 2 diabetes, he realized fasting could fix it. And more recently, the Joslin Diabetes Center, which is a world-renowned center, top orthodox, group, not, not, nothing edgy here, have said just in, uh, a few weeks ago, it is now clear that a major mistake was made in the 1970s in recommending an increase in carbohydrates to greater than 40% of the total daily calories. This era should come to an end if we seriously want to reduce obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemics. And they are absolutely correct, except for one thing, 40% is probably a little too high. Okay. Here, just to tie together, all these dysfunctions are largely related to the same types of root causes. So diabetes and heart disease are intricately linked together. I'll just show you a study that, again, only came out in 2015, in February. Took 4,004 patients with no reported history of diabetes. These are not diabetics. And they did their blood sugars, the most important measurement that anyone can get taken. And they found out that of these heart disease patients, nearly a third were actually diabetic. I would not be surprised at that, but I guess a lot of people would. What's more, under the criteria for ADA, 66% were high risk for diabetes from their glycemic control. So you think about that. You take a random 4,000 heart disease patients, and you find around up to 66% of them are essentially pre-diabetic or diabetic. And that'll tell you how intimately linked these problems are, because they're all problems of hyperinsulinemia, okay, and the human reaction to that. Now, how to get fatty liver? Because essentially diabetes, put very simply, is excessive carbohydrate, hyperinsulinemia, which is needed to go up to manage the carbohydrate, because you can't allow your blood sugar to go high or you'll, you'll die, uh, and the insulin keeps rising, and then it begins to ram the sugar into your liver, your pancreas, and your organs. And we know from animals, and I mentioned this in the cholesterol conundrum, how do you get the huge fatty liver in the goose for foie gras? Well, you feed it carbohydrate. You feed it grain, and you make it hyperinsulinemic, and then there's de novo lipogenesis, the creation of fats from the sugar, and the liver fills up with fats created from the sugar stimulus. So we know how to do it. We know with cattle that we make them fat and they're marbled fatty meat by feeding them grain. So the way to fatten mammals and make them hyperinsulinemic and put them in that dysfunctional state is to give excessive carbohydrate, not fat. Uh, and sumo wrestlers as well. 
85 to 90 percent carbohydrate diets, nearly no fat. That's how they do it. Okay. Uh, here's just one study. Don't worry, I won't show you a load of them. Um, they gave high sugar carbohydrate diet to people who were overweight for a short period. I think it was only six weeks or so. A small increase in weight, 2%, because weight increases steadily, slowly over time. But a 27% increase in liver fat was precipitated, and a 27% increase in de novo lipogenesis, which is the body's creation of fats from carbohydrates in the diet. And then when they fast them, they bring them right back down again, and they take away all the signs of it. The predictability of diabetes, and this is a tragedy. Remember, half a billion diabetics in the next 10 or 15 years. These are guys who are diabetic, but they had their data for their blood sugar control, their glycemic control for the previous 12 years. I mean, engineers here, you know, read it and weep. Here's control people staying at the good glycemic control of around 5.2 uh, millimoles per liter. And diabetics with tight error bars all show the classic pattern. The reality is you can go in and just do someone's blood sugar, ideally do a postprandial or post-meal blood sugar and look at the two-hour curve, and you can pretty much tell they're on the road to diabetes many, many years in advance. But normal people don't really get their blood sugars looked at too closely. You know, it's mainly diabetics. That's a big mistake. So there it is. Now, here's Dr. Fung's uh, just a half dozen of his patients. He is fixing people's diabetes hand over fist, as is Dr. Westman, as in Dr. Jay Workman, as in my friend Jeff, as in Eads, everyone. You can fix type 2 diabetes by low carbohydrate diets. Some people lose a lot of weight on them. That's common. Some people only lose a little weight. Maybe they're not adhering as much to the diet. But here's their insulin medication at the start. And after a few months, they're all off insulin. They are off their medication. And the reason is, a few months of low carb means their glycemic control all comes back into line. Their blood sugars and their HbA1c and all the technical measures that say you're diabetic are all normal. They are cured. Here's a 27-year-old. HbA1c of 10%. You should be around 5. 10% is crazy high. Three medications. Didn't like being on the meds. Smart girl, did a bit of study, found out the whole thing was upside down, went on a low-carb diet, lost 20 pounds, that doesn't matter so much. She was cured in a very short period. So this is the lie of type 2 diabetes. It's curable, but only if you take away the causal factor, the insulin, and the only way to take that away is to lower the carbohydrate. <laughs> there is no other way. So the problem, Diabetes Australia here, over time most people with type 2 diabetes will also need tablets and many will also need insulin. It is important to note that this is just the natural progression of the disease. That's not true. Because a naturally progressive disease, like maybe Alzheimer's or multiple sclerosis, naturally progresses. But this one is driven by carbohydrate in the diet that continues to drive hyperinsulinemia. More insulin is added to the patient to try and shove the blood sugar out of the bloodstream and into every organ or into your eyes, thus we get retinopathy, into the peripheral vascular system where you get all those peripheral vascular issues. And it basically is giving the problem in more quantity. Crazy, okay? <laughs> I don't know you in the audience, John. I ah, know that's, that's from the web. Okay, so here's the American Diabetes Association. In fact, for most people, type two diabetes is a, prog a progressive disease. Same thing, it's not true, it's a lie. Now, I don't know to what extent they know it's not true or they believe it's true, but it's not actually true. And oral medications, insulin, 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 since it was discovered, is piled on. Using insulin to get blood glucose levels to a healthy level is a good thing, not a bad one. That's not true. Because shoving the glucose that you're eating, it's getting into your system, you're insulin resistant, so you're racking up insulin to control it. You still can't control it because your pancreas is worn out and it can't give enough insulin, so you inject insulin. All you're doing is shoving the sugar out of the bloodstream and into the, the periphery and the organs. So it's pretty much bizarre. So I got a last slide, and the reason I'm going through this is just to give you a flavor of hyperinsulinemia, diabetes, which is a signature disease of the mistaken dietary guidelines 30 years ago. And I'll just show you something else about insulin. I've got a lot of data on insulin. I've studied a long time. But this was a great study uh, on heart disease patients and against controls. So basically, you've heard about triglycerides. High is bad. 
and that's true. So here on the front row, we have low triglycerides, and the back row, we have high triglycerides. And this is against the odds ratio or risk of ischemic heart disease. And that's up to a 10x factor. So, you know, we're talking big differences. But if your insulin is low, right, below 12, these guys, trigs higher, trigs low, doesn't matter so much because insulin dominates. If your fasting insulin is low here, this very important measure of your total over your HDL cholesterol, LDL is irrelevant largely, um, also it doesn't matter nearly so much because the fasting insulin, when it's low, most of the other things fall into line anyway. And people who still are a bit high in the other things, they're no longer very high risks because insulin dominates. And we see here apolipoprotein B. Now your LDL measurement you get in Ireland doesn't mean a whole lot, but the count of the LDL particles signified by this protein does. And as you can see, high is very bad there for very high risk versus low. But look when insulin is low in, these peop in the people. They can even have a high ApoB, which is a known risk factor to associate. It doesn't matter. So that's just to give you a sense of the importance of insulin um, before we go on and watch the film. Type 2 diabetes is a disease of hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance that results from the hyperinsulinemia. The cure is to reduce insulin because that's the causal factor provoked by carbohydrate. And that's pretty much it. So we probably won't do questions now. That's just a primer. We'll go on and watch the film and we can do a bit of Q&A afterwards. Okay? Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Any questions about that or maybe what I mentioned beforehand? Any thoughts? Waterlogged, I think. Yeah, a few deaths in, in athletes. Yeah. yeah. Again, uh, a lot of the research or a lot of the, the common wisdom was really funded by big sports drink companies. Yeah. They don't drink twice as many gallons of water as they should do. Again, you, you look back at it, don't you? Anything you're looking at the evidence and uh, the preventive things that go on, yeah, no, Noakes was great. I met him there, we, we chatted, and he did a couple of, re several really great talks, a mixture of science, history, and his own experience. But absolutely, he looks back now on the signs that were coming up that actually the carbohydrate wasn't the way to go. But <coughs> naturally, you kind of push those aside. You've got confirmation bias towards what you truly believe. When he did discover, though, he had the uh, courage to actually come out and say it. And he says he got a sustained torrent of abuse. Uh, interestingly, a dean of his university that he kind of, I guess, reported into published a letter to all the universities uh, only relatively recently and said that Professor Noak should not be listened to and he is going to cause serious injury to people's health. Um, and that guy is incorrect and he f it's a, a first, I think, to actually publish a letter. So it shows you the backlash against this is enormous. And one of the reasons was mentioned there. I mean, facing up to being wrong for 40 years. I mean, Dr. Jason Fung there, again, excellent talks, is fixing people left, right, and center, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, but he also knows that he put people down the wrong road for like a decade, and the very same patients he's now fixing. So he's got this guilt at doing it incorrectly, but at least he knows it now. Uh, and the same with Noakes. But a lot, a lot of these guys, it's just Finney and Eads and others, I suppose, 30 years ago knew this. So their level of frustration should be even higher. And the wealth of the evidence is astonishing supporting this. I mean, I'm not going to go into it here. I went into some of it at the seminars. It's incredible. It's irrefutable. I think Einstein said no hypothesis is ever fully proven. It's always possible that contradicting data may arise that will make reassessing the hypothesis a necessity. A necessity. But this one, the hypothesis of high carb being a problem, and high fat uh, being actually the best for most people. Uh, the data is as good as it can get, you know, over the last 50 years. But facing up to that is almost impossible for people who have spent their whole careers uh, telling people the opposite. But the next 10 years is going to happen. 
because it's irrefutable, it's, it's going to happen. And the internet is enabling it. Because I got access two years ago, and I began to study this literally within a couple of weeks of researching the last 50 years of papers, I began to realize, hold on a sec, it's not like it was said. And then within more weeks, I was able to contact people, cardiologists, preventative guys, PhDs around the world, and they respond because they're a relatively small group. And they're delighted to see people who are also copping on uh, to how it really works. Anyway, so that's a long answer. Yeah, Prof Noakes, great guy. Yeah. The problem with calories, um, calories in, calories out, is the theory that is pushed everywhere. You got to, the calories you take in, you either burn them off or you add them on as fat. Calories in, calories out, CICO, C I C O. And a lot of people in the field who understand this stuff call them psychopaths <laughs> who say that uh, because it's kind of rubbish. Um, it's not really the calories. It's in a, a mammalian organism, the way you feel hungry or not hungry and whether you store fat or don't store fat is driven by the hormonal system, insulin, glucagon, uh, leptin and, and ghrelin. And it's quite a complex system and it responds to the type of foods you eat. Uh, the calories in, calories out is of little use. Uh, you can give general guidelines, you know, I don't know what it is now, 2,000 for women and 2,500 for men, but it's not really about the calories. It's about the nature of the food because that will change your appetite. It'll change whether you store fat or you feel energetic and you take energy from the food. What drives this is the nature of the food. Um, the calories in, calories out is for steam engines. Uh, of course, if you eat a high-fat, low-carb, healthy diet and you particularly not force yourself, but you push yourself to eat more food than you maybe need, you will kind of put on weight. But if you take a high carb diet, for most people who will get insulin resistant, and you push up the amount you eat, you know you'll really put on weight because the insulin will stop the burning of your own body fat, the insulin will enhance your appetite with the sugar crash that follows the elevation of insulin, and you'll have multiple reinforcing loops happening, hormonal and other, and you'll drive your weight upwards. A human can't count calories. Around 25 calories extra per day over 10 or 20 years will add up to being very overweight. You can't count calories to manage what your system should manage naturally. And that's, yeah, it's a problem. But there's still people, they want to say, and all the soft drinks manufacturers, they want to say it's all about calories in, calories out, because that moves the tr away from the truth. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, again, a long-winded answer, but it's not really about the calories. Good question. Yeah, so is there something lurking in low carbohydrate that could happen down the road? The problem is you can only go with the preponderance of the data. So historically, there are many um, peoples who ate extremely high carb diets, or sorry, extremely high fat diets, like the Eskimos, the Maasai warriors wouldn't even eat, eat vegetable. Uh, it wasn't seen as manly. So they'd have blood, milk, uh, and meat, you know, from animals. Uh, the rates of heart disease were extremely low. Uh, and there are many peoples like that. There were exceptions to the fat hypothesis, but Ansel Keys dismissed them. He said the peculiar habits of primitive peoples have no bearing on this scientific matter. But they did, because they were black swans. And they said that the theory was wrong. And the France being the lowest heart disease, three times lower than America, and they eat twice the saturated fat, and they're the lowest heart disease in Europe, is another exception, which was also ignored. So there's the whole historical thing uh, around human peoples that says it's fine. There's all the evidence from all the studies that say it's fine. Uh, all the body markers, and that's probably the most dramatic thing for me because I like the biochemistry. 18 out of 18 studies that were reasonably well done of high carbohydrate, uh, calorie controlled diets, try keeping the calories down controlled, 
set against high fat diets with no control. They were just told to eat high fat. They didn't have to calorie control. 18 out of 18 showed better weight loss in the high fat diet. But the other thing is, all the studies when you measure the key biomarkers, I think Finney mentioned there, the key biomarkers of fasting insulin, blood glucose, uh, HDL, triglyceride. Triglyceride can drop 40 to 50 percent uh, within a week or two of going on a low carb diet. It can rapidly fall. So all the biomarkers we know for health improve overwhelmingly. So that's probably the biggest thing because that's all you can go on. There are some studies in China on long term low carb and they equally check out fine but there's not enough of them because we've squandered 40 to 50 years and hundreds of millions of dollars straining against the leash to try and prove the rubbish that Ansel Keys came up with. All of the hundreds of millions of dollars and the Women's Health uh, Initiative, these massive studies all came up blank, right? In terms of showing that fat was bad. But all the effort has gone in and now no one wants to pay for studies, especially studies to say that we were wrong for 50 years. So you get small studies, they all check out all the biochemistry, the historical anthropology, that's where EADS is particularly good, uh, all the biometrics, all the data, everything lines up, but ultimately you're going to have to get a cohort of people that do it for 40 years to actually prove that. But I know I'm fine and I've spent years studying it and you know we've been through a lot of issues and yeah, there's no question about it. And Finney's on it for 35 years and EADS and all again, excellent health. And, you know. And all these doctors that you've seen are fixing people every day with low carb diets. And what I said earlier at the start of the talk, it basically kind of is obvious if the carb is driving insulin and it's correlated with every dysfunction and diabetes and exploding obesity and diabetes epidemic, I mean, how likely is it that low carb, when all the metrics get better, has some problem? I mean, you can say anything could be a problem, but you need data. There's no data saying there's a problem. Oh, yeah. It has to come down to what's on the plate, you know. The mm. body that provides the theoretical basis and, you know, the evidence that checks it for it. really does come down to what's on the plate. I mean, so, you know, whole grain rice is maybe not good, whole grain wheat is maybe not good. You know, what is on the plate? Um, what do you. Oh, in my case. Have, you know, like okay, yeah. Is it, and is it all weird stuff or is there. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's probably. What I drink is probably weird stuff. No. Um, it's, there's nothing unusual whatsoever and it's actually very simple. Now I probably want to do a talk on diet and I avoided doing it before because I didn't want to give a diet talk, I wanted to give technical talks on biochemistry and stuff. The diet basically is, in the morning I'll have several eggs or I'll have some rashers or sausage or something or I'll have tins of sardines. All very high fat, I won't be hungry right up to lunch. Regularly enough I have no breakfast because to be honest, I do a little bit of intermittent fasting and it really works for me and it gets my ketones up, which are anti-inflammatory and they have huge benefits. Um, so that's the breakfast. It's always gonna be a high fat breakfast uh, or I'll have cheese sometimes. I know it sounds funny for breakfast, but often I'll just break a block of cheese off. Uh, lunch, I will have the salad, um, tomatoes, in case anyone in America sees this. Um, <laughs> tomatoes, that's Irish. Tomatoes, uh, cheese, some meat maybe, whatever's in the fridge, uh, pepperoni or something, um, throw in handfuls of nuts. You know, macadamias particularly are very high in monounsaturated fat. Some nuts are quite high in carb. Um, I'm trying to think, I'll just make this salad and I'll just throw stuff into it. I, won't even, I obviously don't eat bread, so I won't have a sandwich, but that makes it easier. I get a pot and I throw everything in. Put balsamic all over it in here, that's my lunch. And dinner then, uh, my wife Eilish actually is always was very traditional in dinners. So it's meat and veg, only it's a lot more veg now, and it's a lot less potato or rice. But we'll still have curries and things. They'll have loads of coconut oil in them. They'll be bursting with healthy fat, but we will have rice. But I'll just take a small portion of rice now, whereas I used to take a big portion of rice and soak it up with the, with the substrate or the, the juices. So, um, and then uh, in the evenings, cream with dark chocolate, and stuff like that as a snack. But I try not to snack at night anymore. And again, I don't have the hunger because I'd be very fat adapted. So I've got 100,000 calories on me I can draw on. 
Uh, there were interesting experiments. One of the best ever, I think, was 400 days with no food for a very obese gentleman. I think it was in Scotland around 30, 40 years ago. Don't know if you'd be allowed to do it now. But they gave water and, and nutrients, but no food. Um, and at 400 days of fasting, uh, obviously he was a lot smaller, um, but there were no ill effects. So remember that the saturated fat and the fats that were bad was based on BS, unfortunately. But once it got hold, it was tenacious. Our body, when it needs to store healthy energy, makes fat and saturated fat. Think of the logic. <laughs> How could there really be a problem with it? Our body makes it to store, and our body can run off it for up to 400 days. No problem. You know? Anyway. If you're in, yeah, there, there are a lot of people out. So I'm low carb, moderate protein, high fat, very high fat. There are people who want to stay in ketosis all the time. And people who have weight issues sometimes have to push it to really low carb. So they get their blood ketone level up. And if you then eat a carby thing, you'll throw yourself out of ketosis for 24 or 48 hours. And that could be a problem for people. For me, though, it's not. And I say for most people, it's not. But some people are very hardcore. They're wedded to ketosis. The other thing is um, ketones, when you're running on it, is way better than glucose, as was mentioned in the film. Uh, ketones are being explored more and more now. In, in vitro, they've been shown to have very positive effects with cancer cells. Ketogenic diets, ultra-low carb, were used for diabetes at the turn of the century. They were used for uh, epilepsy. So epilepsy, the primary um, fix for epilepsy uh, 100 years ago was a ketogenic diet and miraculous and it's still used for epileptics who don't respond to drugs you know a ketogenic diet oncologists now in cancer treatment I'm hearing more and more about ketogenic diets being the first course of therapy and then they're adding medications uh, so I think the next 10 years uh, low carbohydrate was driven for weight loss 20 years ago that was the first revolution it was Atkins Atkins was a difficult kind of character he was very abrasive and there was a huge backlash and we didn't have the internet so it kind of died. You remember all the newspaper reports. I used to wonder, why does everyone hate Atkins so much? Why do they, I mean, why do they care so much? And that was the forces couldn't tolerate a high fat diet. The second low carbohydrate revolution, which we're now in, there's a book recently, The World Turned Upside Down by an excellent professor of biochemistry in New York, who's known this for 30 years, but of course not listened to, uh, Professor Richard Feynman. Uh, he says, and I'm inclined to agree with them, this is the second low carbohydrate revolution, but this will work because the internet is allowing sharing. The only reason I gave the seminars, the only reason I fixed my health, the only reason I learned all this was access to the, to the material and the internet and linking up with medical people worldwide. Uh, he reckons also that it may be cancer that drives the second low carbohydrate revolution because there's a lot of emerging theories on cancer being a metabolic disease, more to do with the mitochondria than the nucleus per se. And because, you know, there may be treatments all around that involving low carbohydrate, you know, that will give it another impetus, not to mention the communication ability of the internet and lots of other factors and leaders like we saw here at the start uh, and the low carb summit itself, world first. And it's gonna get huge coverage over time. So I think all of these forces are coming together. The science is irrefutable. 50 years have been squandered. You've seen the figures, half a billion type two diabetics. That was a big human experiment that was undertaken with no data. No, no data, I would call data. Um, and we're seeing how it played out now. And it will have to be reversed. I mean, it's just gotta be. It, the, the world, economics can't support the health costs of the next decades. Not, not with what's going on. And it's largely got a broad single root cause. So the original data, sorry about for the Atkins from mm. Scandinavia, was that more based on athletes under an hour, an hour and a half, as opposed to endurance athletes that burn fat better for endurance? But so mm. what was wrong with the original data as such that in the first hour, hour and a half of sport? Because that's still proven to be good data. Yeah. The f for shorter sprinting type activity, you push yourself into a carb burning zone. Now this guy here on endurance, he was burning very small amounts of fat. And as he increased up to 75% fat, even at like 250 watts, he's in an optimum zone, lowest inflammation, and he can go forever. 
It's fantastic. That's what was not known. If you're going to do an hour long flat out sprint type activity, you're going to go into the carbohydrate zone, you know, to get the maximum energy. So if you carve up for that shorter, more intense activity, you, pr you want to be fat adapted, and this is the way I view it, and take in carb to get your glycogen battery up also. Uh, but the short sprinting, glycogen is a fast burning fuel, it'll give you higher energy for shorter, more intense periods, and you'll get more performance. But it is mm. the point then that a lot of teams are not doing professional teams, they're not doing this low fat, you know, low fat, high fat, mm. and then, you know, get the carbohydrate source before that, or are they? I don't know. I, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, well, to be honest, I haven't looked too much into the sporting side. As you probably know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really <laughs> in do much sport. Um, my personal view in it is be fat adapted, but I would say your glycogen store is there. And if you just carb up moderately before a race, and it's only an hour, so you're not going to bonk anyway, and you're going to be intense. I found personally, too, that I'm fat adapted, but when I run, um, I'm, if I go for a 5K and I want to do it fast, you know, if I just eat half a banana beforehand, it makes a difference. I mean, it get, you're fat adapted, so you've got this great fat burning machine, and you're throwing a bit of glycogen in the tank too, um, which just makes it even easier and means you can go harder. What you should really do and where the threshold is where you should not really take any carb at all, obviously 45 days rowing, no carb. Um, marathon, no carb. I don't know, when you get down to half hour events where you're flat out, I'm, I might perceive that having access to a pile of glycogen, it'll, it'll be good for that. You know. But the exact detail, I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, I'm more interested in the health and probably the question earlier about long term, there's no question in my mind because all of my biomarkers, and uh, I don't know if it's feasible to get this up now, but I got some more recent, no. It's not responding. Oh, there it is. I think I have it here. It's probably worth looking at. If I can. Sure huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Well, this is purely for scientific purposes. It's not all about me. Oh, here. here. But this slide is. Th <laughs> this slide is about me, and I'm okay with that. Just this once. So what we see here is I showed at the, I think the metabolic syndrome seminar back in 2013, yeah, uh, the green bars are the straight switch between high-ish carb, not that high. I was on my way probably pre-diabetic kind of scene, 5.6 glucose, you know, high GGT, signs of inflammation, high blood pressure, all that crap. Um, but I didn't realize, you see, what I was doing wrong. I was just eating moderate to high-ish carb. When I switched to low carb, uh, eight weeks later, everything got better. That's the kind of, not the bright green bars there. Um, and here recently, my HDL now, after 18 months, I just got another blood test. And I wasn't even in a hurry to get a blood test because I'm not that worried about it now because I have confidence <laughs> in everything. But you can see there, my HDL is up to 1.98. And my ratio total to HDL, which is the best measure you can get from our existing tests, unless you get a New net n or nuclear magnetic resonance particle counting, can't get it here in Ireland, uh, is now down to 3.13. And my triglycerides, I actually haven't got the panel, I just got these from uh, Doc, who's a friend of mine, over the phone. Uh, but the trigs are going to be down probably around 0.72, I would infer from the other, other metrics. So after 18 months, they're getting even better. And I have blood pressure control, which I never had, except when I was training for triathlon. That's my favorite because blood pressure is a significant indicator of dysfunction. And the way to get blood pressure down is to cut the uric acid cycle and basically low carb, low inflammation, and lower the blood pressure and lower the insulin. It, it all goes the one direction. And that's another sense of the strength of a proof. If every single measure and everything in a complex problem all goes the right way with one particular um, factor you've changed, everything, the chances of it being wrong begin to collapse into zero. But Einstein said, you'll never prove something fully. You've got to use your judgment. OK, so that's. Um, immune system, um, I'm not sure, really. I didn't really get measures of immunological. 
Uh, I've, anecdotally, you hear particularly arthritic conditions, and I'm not sure persons in the audience here, but there's several people have said to me as well, inflammation and conditions with sore joints and other kinds of sports injury type things greatly improved very quickly. And that's a repeat thing you're going to hear. Um, Intra there's some other funny things that I, I'll just mention now, but they sound a bit kind of, uh, you know, acupuncture or shaman stuff. My nails changed utterly within several weeks. And the nails went from having lots of white dots on them, which I think might relate to calcium or calcium homeostasis, I'm not sure. Uh, they got vastly stronger. I mean, I can practically open tops of, you know, really noticeably, tops of bottles. And uh, it was just an interesting sideline. So all the body metrics, all the biometrics, uh, everything. But I just, there's some extras that are unusual. Your skin quality, you know, if you have any kind of spots, you know, people get small pimples and things, but that kind of all goes away. The nails get stronger. To be honest, it's proper nutrition because a lot of the vitamins are fat soluble. And by pushing towards low fat, you are starving yourself of some of the key nutrients you know, evolutionary required for the machine. So by going on a high fat diet, I'm getting all the nutrients, all the fat soluble vitamins, and the fats themselves for my cellular structure. I'm getting a healthy diet, not the one that was unfortunately pushed 50 years ago. Ah. Salts. Magnesium is extremely important. Um, the estimate is there's 70% plus of Americans are deficient in magnesium. And I think there's a complexity to measuring it. And again, no one really measures it. Because you only measure the cholesterol, right? Because everyone's just talked about cholesterol for 50 years. Uh, magnesium is extremely important for the muscle performance, um, for heart health, and for many other reactions in the body. It's a very, very important um, element. Uh, so I actually just take a magnesium supplement and it's a big pot of stuff that my, my wife actually bought somewhere, two tablespoons, and it tastes, you know, metallic. Uh, and I just take those randomly. So I don't get real careful about exactly what I do. I just take the knowledge, right, and I apply it loosely because life, I'm so far better than I was before having learned this that I'm not too anal about being exactly right. But magnesium is, there's a huge deficiency in magnesium and low magnesium can predispose towards high blood pressure and lots of other issues. And it also interacts with vitamin D in, in, in certain ways. So uh, in terms of salts then, well, it was mentioned in the film, salt has been seen as the bad boy for decades. And in salt sensitive hypertensives and people who are very overweight and people with renal function issues or kidney function, salt can be problematic. <coughs> but again, the research is coming out in the last few years that salt has been shown lower is higher mortality, higher is higher mortality in other reports, in the middle I is the worst place to be in other reports. So the, the noise in the data around salt, what you hear about salt being bad is so noisy, it's almost valueless. I spent a bit of time researching and I got tired of it. Because one reports is one thing, one reports is another, they're all only 1.2, 1.3 factors of mortality and anything in an associational study where you just look at the people salt versus death. You really want to be seeing something like a 2x change in death to be getting comfortable, it's a real factor. Otherwise, it's just in the noise. So the pr thing about a low carb, a high fat diet is, you know, you, you do need to get adequate salt. And the Eskimos had the this uh, saline broth and they use seawater and they got blood of caribou and you know probably instinctively knew you need salts um, to help digest so a very long-winded answer I'm sorry but um, you need to make sure you have adequate salt uh, as was mentioned in the film and magnesium is important okay Thank you. last question <laughs> that's it Mm. Okay, I, I know so many people in the field now, <laughs> I won't mention the right people. Uh, I'd say, look, to keep it simple and not to have any favoritism, the art and science of low carbohydrate living uh, is a very good start. Um, and I'd say Dr. Reed's protein power gives some of the history, some of the anthropology, and also guidelines around how would you, one should eat with eating plans. 
Uh, but there's a lot of other books out. I might send around a list, actually, an email afterwards. That might be the fairest thing to do, so everyone's covered. Oh, my own? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I have a blog, thefatemperor.com, and, and it's Facebook and Twitter. There's, there's a lot of information in there because everyone's sharing scientific reports, everyone's sharing data. Um, yeah, if, if you go in there, you'll get a lot of quality stuff from the low-carb community. Uh, if you go into other communities that are high-carb or maybe have other ideological beliefs, you'll get a lot of funny stuff, but maybe I'm biased. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good.